Hey, this is Don from Padlock Technologies again with another video. This time, I'm going to do a video on Phantom RP. Now, I'm going to use the same lab that I showed you yesterday, which is the multi fabric lab. But I did do a video like a couple months, like a few months back actually, about Phantom RP. Now, I went over the theory of it, so it was a whiteboard or a blackboard video. But now I'm going to actually show you the configuration, what that looks like. Now, I did it in the campus fabric and I did it in the data center fabric. I kind of like doing Phantom RP, but a lot of people, every time I say, hey, configure Phantom RP, they kind of ask me, you know, what that is. So I decided to make a video on it. Now, if you get any value from this, you know what I always say, please don't forget to share, comment, like, and subscribe to the channel. Again, I love this community that I've built and I appreciate every subscriber I get. So if you click that button, it doesn't cost you a thing. Let's get to the lab and let's take a look at what Phantom RP is. All right, so we've seen this. This is the Megla, Megalodon Lab. <laughs> I don't even know why I said that, but this, this is the Mega Lab that I have the uh, fabric here, the campus fabric, and I have the data center fabric. I'm also going to show you, because I did say that looking at the Type 2 or the Mac to IP binding is a little bit different. I forgot to do that in the last video. So let's take care of that first, and then we'll talk about Phantom RP. So what I meant by that is in the Catalyst uh, Center, uh, not Catalyst Center, or the Catalyst FE, FE, which is the fabric edge, it's a little bit different to see the MAC to IP bindings compared to the uh, Nexus platform. So like I said before, you're going to use that show L2 VPN EVPN MAC IP command, and you're going to get the MAC and the IP. Now, I like this version because it gives you the IP address and it gives you the MAC address and it tells you what the next hop is basically the VXLAN tunnel. Now, on the Catalyst, though, it's a little different. I must have been looking at some routes there. So, on the Catalyst side, now I have VLAN 10. So, what you would just do is show MAC address VLAN 10, and that's it. So, as you can see, though, it does not give you the MAC to IP binding. It gives you the MAC address, but it doesn't give you the MAC to IP binding. And when you see this NVE interface here, now I did use the same loopback, so that's why you see the same loopbacks. You see that the next hop for this MAC is going to be, this is, looks like VTEP2. Yeah, this is for VTEP2. And this MAC would be VTEP3. All right. So that's the difference between the Catalyst way, which I really do like with this, this specific command here that shows you the IP to Mac bindings are the type two route in eVPN. And then you have your, you know, this is how you see the Mac addresses for, you know, Nexus platform. It's okay. Now I know there's another command to do that, but most of the time you're going to be using this show Mac address VLAN 10 in the Nexus platform just to see if you're getting that you know, layer or route to mapping there. At least you see the MAC addresses. This is what's going to validate that you saw the MAC addresses here. All right, now back to what I was saying about Phantom RP. So if you don't know anything from a theory standpoint of Phantom RP, I'm going to put a video somewhere up here somewhere that's going to show you the theory, the whiteboard video that I did a long time ago of what, what Phantom RP is. Watch that to get some theory if you want to, but then I'll put some link. I'll put the link in the description as well, so you don't have to click on the card. But watch that to get the theory. But this is the configuration. So what basically Phantom RP is is I'm going to use an RP uh, RP address or a rendezvous point address for people that don't know what RP is that technically doesn't exist. Right? That's why it's a phantom. Now, if we all know the basic rules of routing longest match wins so that means if i have a slash 29 and a slash 30 the slash 30 wins okay and that's technically what we're going to do so if you look at the spines here and i'm not running anything like msdp or uh, multicast source distribution protocol for people that don't know what that is i'm not running that between the two because it doesn't really matter for phantom rp what basically is going to happen is when i do the join message in multicast, which from a layer two standpoint, it's the IPM, IGMP join, and then that turns into a PIM join for layer three. When I do that join message, 
I'm going to specify the RP address. Now I'm using static RP addresses, right? And it's going to look in the routing table and say, okay, well, where would that IP address exist if I were to go to it? And that's where it's going to use the longest match. So on this spine here, I'm going to show you the IP address that we're using. I'm using loopback, loopback one, by the way, on this. Now, loopback one is 11.1.1253 slash 30. I gave it a 31. I actually didn't give it a 30. So let's actually change that a little bit. Because that should be 30, actually. If I'm not tripping. Yeah, that should be 30. So we're going to do 11.1.1.253. 255, 255, 255, 255, 255. All right, so we're going to leave it at that. And then on the second spine here, we're going to use a 29, which is a 248. So we're going to use a 248 there. Let's make sure I'm advertising that as well. Okay, yep. So what technically would happen, and I believe since I changed it, this might not do it for here. Um, but what technically would happen when those join messages, it's going to say, okay, my RP here, if I show you the configurations for the RP, RP PIM, uh, here we go. So we got this PIM address here that technically doesn't exist, but it falls in between the slash 30 and the slash 29. So it falls in between that. This is the phantom RP. So it's the same thing on this one. Same thing here, right? And when we go to this VTAP, when you see this, now you see that this address does not exist at all. But if we go to the fabric edge, and I go show IP PIM RP mapping, uh, where is that? Did I actually? This is probably why I had an initial issues here. Uh, let's see. What, we'll see what the PIM is. Ah, so we don't have RP PIM RP. Why do I got that on here? RP address. There we go. I'm surprised that it wasn't in here. Now I'm going to check all my other fabric edges to make sure that is there. Because that would cause a major problem. Now I did reboot these, so I may have rebooted it and it just that I didn't save the configurations at one point. Which would suck. But it is what it is. It's not what I look for. Let's go to PIM. There we go. So I did do it on two. And let's do it on one. Make sure we just validate all of this. Um, section IP PIM. Why do I keep forgetting the I in this? <laughs> All right, so we don't have it on here. So we need to actually put this on here as well. So PIM RP address 11.1.1.255. Okay. So now we have our tunnels are up. Let me make sure a tunnel came up over here. Tunnels were up there. That tunnel was already there. So what technically happened is now I did the, the PIM. And what we should see is it should go to, you know, spine one. But again, because I didn't have it on there, I'm not going to be surprised if I see things on spine seven. So if we go to show IP M route, there you go. So technically, my RP, that RP address, and now these uh, these star comma Gs that you're seeing is your share tree. So basically, remember when I showed you in the last video when we did that multicast group for the VNI, you see here's the multicast group for VLAN 10 technically. Here's the multicast group for 
no NVE2. This is NVE1, which is technically for VLAN 10. Um, and this is NVE2. So it's NVE1, 2, and 3, technically. And this is the multicast group for, I believe, IoT. Now, because you see a bunch of shared trees, right? You see your, your OIL. Now, this is why you need to know multicast before you even try to do any of this stuff. And your, in, your in, incoming interface is going to be the loopback, obviously, because you need to do VXLAN tunnels. But then your outgoing interfaces are going to be, you know, these outgoing interfaces. Now, I'll show you on the data center side because I'm running BIDER on the other side. But this is basically the configuration. This address does not technically exist on any of the spines, right? And it's not even in this fabric. And that's where the term phantom, like I said, comes from. So if I go show IP interface brief. As you can see, we do not have an 11, 11, 11, or 11, 1.1.254. We don't have that, right? And same thing on spine two, we don't technically have that either. All right, we don't, we don't technically have that. So we have our phantom RP. And what I basically did was send a join message to the longest match, what I assume, or where I would assume that address would technically exist. Now, what that allows you to do, let's say if spine one went down, well, now I don't need to just reconfigure. I don't need to reconfigure anything because all the join messages would just go to router two based on longest match, right? Now, you, you could do any cast RP, which is put the loop back, same address on, you know, spine one and spine two, run MSDP, and then be done with it. It's just another protocol that I just don't config, don't feel like configuring. So that's why I did Phantom RP. Now, ISIS is a little bit better when it comes to doing this because in ISIS, you don't have to do a command to advertise the subnet. It just does it by default. In OSPF, and I'll show you that in the data center uh, fabric, you have to use a command called IP OSPF advertise sub subnet because if you don't, it's going to be advertised as a slash 32 all the time. All right, and that, that's what messes up the Phantom RP there. But as always, you know, I like to do my test here. I think I might have that already on my laptop, and that's why that's not opening up. All right, so if we go here, just to make sure you guys know it's still working. Uh, there we go. Fabric's still working because we're on technically, this is 2.1. So the fabric is still working. I was surprised that the multicast uh, RP wasn't on there. So that was a that was a little weird. I know I do show IP, so y'all see, I'm dot one, and I'm technically on this fabric edge, and I'm pinging uh, this one fourteen, which is dot two. So that's data center using fabric R, uh, phantom RP with ISIS. So let's jump to the data center now uh, instead of the campus fabric, and I'll show you what that looks like at the data center level. Same concept, not nothing's really changed here, but I'm using OSPF. So what I'm doing here from the OSPF standpoint is we're going to run BIDER. Now BIDER is bidirectional, meaning you can go up and down the tree. So there will be, there won't be any star comma or s comma g's here. So there won't be any source to group trees or you know sort of path tree. There will only be shared trees, which are star comma g's. And it's going to allow you to move up and down the tree. By default, when you're doing multicast, things can only move down the tree from source to receiver, right? With Biter, it can a source can be a receiver and a receiver can be a source. So it can move up and down the tree. You will not see any kind of uh, pruning messages to jump off the shared tree and go to the shortest path tree and stuff like that. Again, study multicast if any of that did not make sense. Study multicast and it would make perfect sense after that. Now, for the spine stuff on the data center fabric, if we look at our, our uh, PIM stuff, I should just say PIM. So, same configuration. Now, if I show you loopback zero, so if you see loopback zero, we have the same, pretty much the same configuration here. And this is our static uh, RP mapping here. So what we're saying is we're going to map this group, which is 224.110 slash 24, 
to the RP11255254254, we're going to, going to use biter so things can move up and down the tree. And then, if you look at the OSPF configurations, exactly what I told you, OSPF, IP OSPF advertised subnet, instead of turning this loop back to a slash 32, which is technically what it would do if you advertise it over OSPF, it will advertise it as the slash 30. So because it's advertising it as the slash 30, now I'm going to use the longest match wins, right? So if we look at two, our spine two, we still have this, we have that same concept here. So we go show run section PIM. Uh, do that. Here we go. Section PIM. You see here where we have the same concept. We're using uh, uh, IP address that technically doesn't exist in the network, but we're going to take advantage of uh, longest match here. And if I look at the loop back, basically the same thing. This is going to be a slash 29. And the, the real critical part here is the OSPF advertised subnet. So when you do that now, if we go to the M route, as you can see, we have the same thing here. Technically, I'm only doing one uh, NVE, and the multicast group is this here, like I showed you in the other video. So as you can see, spine one is getting that join message, and it knows how you know the loopback comes in. It knows what, here's your o o <laughs> OIL, basically the interfaces that it's going to go out on. And if I go over here, we shouldn't see something here. Yep, we don't see anything here because longest match wins. So the slash 30 beats the slash 29. So all my join messages are gonna go to spine one and not spine two. Now spine one goes down, all that stuff reverts to spine two because spine two now has the longest match, which is the slash 29. Now you might see a little blip or, uh, blip or hiccup in traffic because the join messages have to go over to the next um switch but it is what it is now this is where people say this is where you know any cast rp is better than phantom rp to each his own i'm not really going to get into that argument i like phantom rp sometimes i use any cast rp but then you have to get through another protocol and do msdp and make sure the source source the source registration messages are you know flowing between the two msdp pairs and stuff like that so I just do Phantom RP and don't have to worry about that. But, you know, to each his own. So that is Phantom RP in a nutshell. Like I said, I've put the video in the description as well on getting the theory behind Phantom RP. I kind of went over it in this video. But if you want to see it from a whiteboard perspective, watch that video, then come back and watch this video again. And then you'll be a master at Phantom RP. It's just another tool in your toolkit when you want to do something in networking. This is Don from Padlock Technologies again. I hope you liked this video. If you haven't already, like I said before, please don't forget to share, comment, like, and subscribe to the channel. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, and have a nice day.